And forsake not the assembling of yourself as the manner of some is. And the more and more as you see day the day approaching, mm-hmm. we're seeing it. Real. You know, as we were just talking before, I mean, we are really seeing it. It's really being unleashed. The power of darkness, who's going to make war with this beast? They'll just stamp you out and blot you out. You know, they're not content to just let Donald Trump lose and fade into the sunset. they got to go after him. They have to stamp him out. It's like, I, 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 uh, I likened it to somebody who doesn't like a spider. And, and Not that Donald Trump is a spider. There might be a better allegory. But, you know, you could stamp out a bug, right? And then hit it again. And then jump up and down and pound it and, and then hit it again with a sledgehammer. I mean, you could go really over the top if you're incensed with hatred against something. Uh, you don't like a bug or whatever it, whatever it is. So, and this is what they're doing, what the uh, far left is doing. The Marxist left, if you want to call it that, they just, they're not content until they cancel you out, lock, stock, and barrel everything about you. But... If that's what God is going to let happen to bring about darkness and uh, falling away in the new world order, there's nothing we're going to do about it, right? No. So that means their judgment is coming on judgment day. So to whatever degree they're going to cancel out, stamp out, stamp out, and uh, destroy and try to blot all remembrance out, that's, that's the fate that awaits them on judgment day. God will say, okay, I blot you out then, you know. I'll just, we'll just uh, cancel you out. You know, they're trying to write Donald Trump completely out of the book of the world, if you want to put it that way. Well, God has a book of life. But anyway, I'm going to speak a little bit about, just uh, reinforce what we're saying about the New World Order and why we have great tribulation to end the age, the state of the church, the apostasy and the backsliding. And those two words are related, apostasy and backsliding. And uh, there's some hope in this message as well. And just the way we're going, the way I believe God is unfolding this and the reasons he's unfolding it and what we need to do, you know, as far as our approach and our exercise, our spiritual exercise towards God. Bodily exercise profits little, right? Bodily exercise, but godliness profits unto all things, even your physical health, right? That your soul... That you're, you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. So, but there's a cause and effect here and a pattern of things. And, and, here's, and this is what God is doing. You know, He causes all, bond and free, rich and poor, to receive a mark. He causes, doesn't force the issue, but causes, influences, so that you, the circumstance compels you to make a choice. Right? I'm thinking of going back to Canada for uh, a while and now you can't cross the border unless you get a, a, a test, a COVID test. Well, I personally would never get a COVID test. But now they're causing me, I might have to go get a test to prove I'm negative before they allow me to enter the country. We're only, we're only going to be able to go so far with these compliances before it crosses the line and becomes the offense against God, the mark of the beast, or what have you. So we really got to watch all of this stuff. Uh, but you can see how they cause you to do it. Well, God's the same way. Blessed is the man whom thou chooses and causes to approach. There's none that seek after God. No, not one. Not a single man on the face of the earth would ever give God the second thought without God exerting some kind of influence or cause or, you know, throw some affliction in the guy's life to make him ponder, question, look for something else. And then God can present himself to the man's conscience or however God does that. We're... I quoted a scripture last week from Isaiah. By the fire and by the sword shall the Lord plea with all men, all flesh, all men. So God causes things to happen. And so that's from there. I'll I'll start with a scripture in uh, Genesis 7 and then we'll go from there. Genesis uh, uh, chapter 7. This is the account of uh, Noah and the ark. And I'm not going to read too much. I'm just going to take one scripture out of there to illustrate the the uh, principle I'm magnifying tonight, but it was, uh, you know, God told Noah he was going to destroy man whom he created from off the face of the, the earth for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days, forty nights. Every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old 
when the flood of all waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wives, and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. What caused them to go in the ark? Flood. The waters of the flood. John came, Baptist comes in the wilderness pre- preaching the baptism of repentance on uh, the baptism unto repentance. The baptism of John unto repentance. What's a baptism? It's, it's a drowning out, if you will. The whole story of Noah represents a baptism, a drowning out, completely covered in water, so that all the old nature of man, the old nature that was on the earth in those days, that it corrupted itself, was completely destroyed, killed. And it's an allegory for us. The operation of God is God sends waters of affliction. Though though you have the water of affliction and the bread of affliction, yet thine eyes shall still see your teachers. And we may look at that scripture later. And you'll hear a voice saying, this is the way walk ye in it. But the whole thing is, affliction, our waters, uh, is, the flood of waters represents a flood of afflictions. What do the flood of afflictions do? They defeat your old nature, your old man, your old... Your own, your old ambitions, your old lifestyle, it drowns them out. So you can't deliver yourself, you can't save yourself, you can't do anything yourself because the affliction surpasses your ability to do anything about it and it causes you to approach unto God and cry out for God to save you and God to deliver you and it directs your heart and inclines it towards God. And if God didn't do that, you'd never seek God. Because there's none that seek God. God is causing it. God's working in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. And and you've got to do it both. We've got to get to the place, not only do we will, but we do. You know, lots of people get to the point where they, I would like to do God's will, but they don't have the power or the strength to do. That would be Romans 7, the good that I would, I do not, the evil that I would not, that I do. And yeah, you can hang out in that status for a while, but eventually you have to come through that. And experience the delivering power of God and have God empower you to actually fulfill and do His will. So why did they go into the ark? Because of the waters of the flood. What's going to make you forsake all your denominational associations? What's going to make you forsake your worldly ambitions? What's going to make you run to the ark? And the ark, of course, is the body of Jesus Christ. What's going to do it? It's going to be a flood of affliction. What's that thing in Revelation where... There's a great flood of water come out against the, the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and, and helped the woman. Helped the woman. There's going to be a big flood come after us. A flood of persecution. A flood of affliction. What's the net result? It's going to make you seek God. It's going to get you to drop your hang-ups and your fears. The things that get you separated, isolated. Afraid to... Reach out, afraid to fellowship, afraid to approach God, afraid to endure preaching and sound doctrine and the challenges of the revelation of the Word of God. The Word of God is always going to challenge us. The Word of God is always going to reveal. It's always going to make manifest. Whatever makes manifest is light. You've got to come to the light. So what's, what's the sin? What's the condemnation of the world? Oh, you smoke, you drink, you committed adultery. No! Because you wouldn't come to the light. You stayed separated, alone, apart from the body of Christ, independent, whatever. You, you wouldn't come to the light. So that's what you don't want to do that. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship. 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 Like I said last week, or the week before, or both, I don't remember. Where two or three are gathered together in His name. That's people. That's individuals. Two or three together are gathered. There's not where two or three television screens with various preachers have been gathered together in your little room. Oh, and like I said, I mean, because of the present distress and the uh, backsliding state and apostasy of the church, and yes, I'm a part of it, but uh, because of that, God is, is suffering people to... Uh, you know, watch videos and things like that. That's not the perfect method and manner of God as He brings us more and more into the perfect way. We are supposed to gather. We are supposed to assemble, right? I mean, do you have a virtual marriage? Can you have virtual intercourse? No, not very 
<laughs> no, the body's got to come together. You got it? And I don't have to get a graphic or anything, but you see the point. Here's our feast of uh, charity, our love fest. So this is the whole thing about tribulation and the pattern of God. Why did Noah head for the ark? Why did he head for fellowship in the body of Christ? Why did he head for gathering himself together with fellow Christians? Seek it out diligently, pursue it deliberately, intensely, more and more, because the day is approaching. We've got to get our strength by gathering. You know, we have to have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light, He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There's a qualifier there. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship. We have fellowship. We have fellowship. So Noah went in and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach. How does he cause to approach? Through affliction, a flood of affliction. See where we're going? The church won't get on board with the will of God that is necessary for us to come to perfection. Or if, if it won't, God will ramp up the affliction to cause you to drop, shed off those things that are weights and everything else. And I have my own struggles with uh, being entangled with the cares of life and working at hotels and everything else. Well, what's, what's changing my mind? I said last week, give me about two weeks. I'm pretty much on course. I got about a week, week and a half of work, and then I am, I am, have a determination. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not working. For how long? I don't know. Maybe for two or three months. Maybe that's it. I'll never work again. Maybe I'll never work again. Well, what's, what's changing my mind to, to be a li little more deliberate and actually press to make it happen? What's, what's working in me? Because all the things I see coming upon the face of the earth, that's why. Well, we're getting really close to the mark of the beast and the new world order. And you see that tide of evil and darkness sweeping in and having its way and nobody seems to be able to stop it. That's the fourth beast. Diverse from all the other beasts. Has all technology behind it. It's unified and has great strength and power and knowledge about people. All kinds of data profiles on people and they can do whatever they want. They can be a bunch of hypocrites. They can, they can cry for, for violence and unrest uh, uh, two or three months ago. And then, then now, now when they see a little demonstration on Capitol Hill, they can flip around and say that they're inciting violence and that these things should never happen. Just look at the hypocrisy of what's going on. If you have any sensibility and if you are exposed to the right sources of information, there's no question about it. Just hypocrisy, double standard on the side of the left. So what, the, what does that mean? That means darkness is having its way. They can lie, they can cheat, they can be hypocrites, and you can expose it in the media. You can see the hypocrisy, you can see the lies, you can document it, you can have troves of evidence against it. It doesn't matter. They're still having their way. They're still accomplishing what they want. Nobody can stand against this beast. They'll just stamp you out. Amen. So I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I get upset at it a little bit. I say, come on, God. Look, this is wicked. Well, we are talking about it at the dinner table today. But so I, my, my resolve and all that in my conscience is just, well, if this is what has to be to bring the New World Order in and to snap, snap us out of our complacency and get me to finally back off on work so I'm not so choked out by it, and then so, so be it. But, uh, you know, I'm praying against them because of the, the wickedness. It's just, my consolation is, and it's, everybody's like this. When you see the miscarriages of justice and everything else, it just, it, it bothers you. The balances of justice have been upset, and, you know, good men are being stamped out. I say good, quote-unquote, good uh, and I mean, there's none good, but you know what I'm saying. It seems like evil is trying, as a principle, evil seems to be triumphing over even the resemblance of what is righteous. So, so what's your resolve? Your resolve is you defer it to judgment day. God knows. You see the you see the violent polluting of judgment and justice. Don't marvel. Don't get too bent out of shape out of it. Understand what it means in context of the end of the age and how, how God is letting it happen and why he's letting it happen. And there has to be a great falling away. Otherwise, the son of perdition can't be revealed. We've gone over that for the last few weeks. The fullness of Antichrist can't come forth as long as there's a standard and a spirit of righteousness resisting it. It's, he's not at liberty to fully come forth. So God has to let it fall away so he can come forth. 
have his hour of darkness. Let them all feel, uh, think like they've got it. They're successful. We've got our new world order. We're the power. We're in control. We did it. And then bang! Like the lightning shines from the east to the west. The coming of the Lord. Suddenly the Lord shall appear in flaming fire, taking vengeance, burning up all the wicked with the brightness of His God. All of a sudden, this... You think you got it all in the bag and boom. So that's where we have to put our meditation. You know, Jeremiah and all the other prophets. Jeremiah 12 is a favorite scripture of mine. I think of it a lot and refer to it a lot. Jeremiah had trouble with his conscience. He was rustling in his conscience. He said, uh, righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with you. So he starts out by affirming that God is righteous, right? God is righteous. Jeremiah says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with you. Where, yet let me talk to you about your judgments, God. Let me talk to you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why? So Jeremiah saw the way of the wicked prosper and seemingly didn't see any uh, carrying forth of, of balancing the scales or justice come forth. And it troubled him. And he almost questioned God. I know you're right, God, but how can the way of the wicked prosper? Well, that's what I go through when I look at everything happening in politics. How come these guys, how can they get away with it? So what do I have to do? I have to defer it to Judgment Day. Well, you know, God knows. You see the violent polluting of justice and judgment in the province, as it says in Ecclesiastes. Marvel not at the matter. Don't get too bent out of shape. Because uh, there are higher than authorities than they that are doing the corruption. And then God yet is higher than the highest. And he regards all things. God regards it all. God's going to balance the scales. Now here's the thing. If you see the balances of, of justice balancing out in this life, that's one thing. If you do not see the, the judgment and the balances of judgment and justice balance out in this life, then it has to be balanced on the great white throne judgment. Because make no mistake about it, everything has to come to its balance. Everything. Nature itself tells you if you have a bunch of water in a pot or a glass or a container and you tilt it and some of the water goes this way and the water's higher on that end than this end, the water still has to come back to its level, right? Everything has to come back to its balance. Everything has to come back. So you see a man do evil and he never receives for his evil in this life. Guess what? The principle is still the same. It has to come to its balance. So where does the balance? Where is the balance reckoned? In eternity. Well, that's not too good then, because the consequence of reckoning is also an eternal consequence. That's why you want your sins to go on beforehand, before going forth unto judgment. Some men's sins follow beforehand, going before judgments. Other men's sins follow afterwards. Well, anyway, so Noah went in. Why? Because of the waters of the flood. Why do you flee to the body of Christ? Why do you shake yourself from your dust, your flesh, your old nature, your complacency? What sh- makes you shake it off saying, what am I doing? I'm, a- I'm asleep. I got to get, I got to find out what God's will is. I got to be ready for the tribulation. This life is about the perfection of the saints and being ready to meet God. No, I got to shake myself. Got to awake. What causes you to do that? The afflictions. The flood. It's the flood. Noah went in, his sons, his wives, his sons' wives with him, into the ark, into the body of Christ, to the gathering of the saints. Why? Because of the waters of the flood. And as much as God's people are afraid to or don't want to or refuse to, and you know, I'm not saying, there's different reasons why people don't uh, flee to Jesus Christ. But for whatever reason, when the flood comes, it causes you to approach. But presently, we're, uh, we are in the uh, state of backsliding. And again, I'm a part of it, so I'm not pointing a finger here, but this is what I received. Um, let me start, uh, no, well, let me continue, I guess, in Jeremiah 3. So the Lord said, also unto me in the days of Hosea the king. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. 
and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of, of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. And in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, they shall come together out of the land of the north, the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children, and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return ye backsliding children, and I will... Heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. And this is the call we're in. Right? The Bible says, if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it? It's nothing good for nothing except to be thrown out and being trampled under foot of men. The church lost its savor, its effectiveness, its purity, its holiness, its sting to the conscience of men that live around it. Because it's backslidden. It's gone the way of the Lord. It's adopted the compromise. It's greased up the grace. It's permitted things. It's allowed things. It's dropped the standard. It's dropped the diligence. It's dropped the pursuit. It's dropped its consciousness of the intensity, the urgency, the importance, the imperative, the necessity of seeking God first and counting the testimony of Jesus, the lifestyle that you portray of utmost importance in every aspect, both what's in your inner man and what as, as a spirit and also what appears outwardly in your flesh. Both are important. But you just clean first the inside that the outward may be clean also. The salt's lost its savor. And we said, well, how does the salt lose its savor? Because it stops... Embracing judgment. It will not judge what's right and wrong. It won't make a stand. It won't make a clear indication of what's right and wrong. This is good. That is evil. And if there is no judgment, then there is no revelation of what's right and wrong. If there's no revelation of what's right and wrong, there's no standard. The conscience begins to sear and fall away then everything becomes allowed. The gates and the walls break down and the spirit of the world begins to enter in. The walls of holiness break down. As we said before, the last week and the week before that, God is calling His own people, Sodom and Gomorrah. What spirit is it that's in the church? It's the spirit of sodomy. That's what's it in the church right now. The spirit of sodomy. Not necessarily physical sodomy, but we covered that last week. A spiritual sodomy. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, licentious idolatry. Feeling like it's not important what happens in the flesh so we can get away with this. We can do away with this. It's all covered. No, it's very important what happens in your flesh. Your flesh is supposed to bring forth the image of Jesus Christ. It's supposed to produce in your flesh, it's supposed to express the divine nature. It's Christ himself coming forth in your flesh. It's the divine nature. It's the Holy Spirit of God. 
He said, I didn't come away to, I didn't come here to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it, to demonstrate it, to live it so you could see it in the life, in my life. And if the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost, and if the Holy Ghost is the nature of God, the name of God, the image of God, the reputation of God, the holiness of God, the power of God, and the purity of God, and He did not come to put away the law, but to fulfill it, let me ask you again, if Christ is coming forth in your flesh, will He lie? Will He cheat? Will He steal? Will He curse God? Will He take the name of the Lord in vain? Will He commit adultery? Will he break the Sabbath? No. He will fulfill and perform all those commandments in your mortal body. So, so don't say we're not under the law. Because uh, if Christ hasn't come forth in you, then you're under the law till Christ comes forth. The Bible says God gave the law in the Old Testament and he kept, we were kept, we were kept under the law till Christ came. That's what happened historically. 4,000 years leading up to the coming of Christ, before Christ came, there was, there was no Holy Ghost, there's no divine nature. The Holy Ghost hasn't been given because Jesus hadn't come and Jesus hadn't been, hadn't been glorified. So God couldn't pour out. It would be unjust for God to pour out the Holy Ghost. So they weren't required to come forth with the standard of holy, pure life in the flesh that we are required to come forth in. They didn't have the divine nature. God winked at their ignorance. This is why I'm saying don't take anything in the Old Testament and think you can carry it forth and apply it at face value in the New. Because there's lots of things in the Old Testament God put up with and He allowed to happen that He does not permit in the New Testament. Right? right? Because the law was given that the whole world may become guilty before God. So before Christ came, what did God give them? He gave them a law. Well, first He let them live by their conscience and that didn't work. And then he let men form governments and they were under human forms of government and that didn't work. And so on and so on. So why was the law added? Because of transgressions. Transgressions against what? Transgressions against God. His holiness, his purity, the law of God. Transgressions against serving God and obeying his voice. So the law was added because of transgressions. So if you're a Christian and you're in the church and Christ has not come forth in you and you're doing things contrary to the law of God, then... then we apply the law to you to magnify and illustrate and, and, and uh, emphasize in your conscience that this is not Christ. You've got to work this out. So we use the law, but we use it lawfully. We just don't trust the law to bring forth righteousness, but we do use the law. When transgressions are increased and added, then we, we preach the law. We know that the law is not for a righteous man, but for ungodly, man-stealers, perjurers, whoremongers, thieves, robbers, anything contrary to sound doctrine, that's who the law is for. So if you're doing any of those things and a man of God preaches the law to sting your conscience with it, that's valid in the sight of God until Christ comes forth. Well, that's an aside. That's an aside. So where was I? I was into something here. Um, so this is... Uh, yeah, so the church has lost its savor because there's no judgment. Uh and so once you lose your savor, it's, it's the same as saying you backslid or you've apostatized. And the word backslide and apostasy in many cases or all, I didn't look at it diligently or exhaustively, but often comes from the same sort of root Greek, backsliding and apostasy. Although in my meditations, without making any reference to, you know, the study of the word and the origins of the word, to me, you know, backsliding... Uh, obviously, is is losing ground from what you've attained. You're backsliding. But then, a full blown apostasy is just completely abandoning what you ever started. Yeah. And that's what I say. I see people offended because of scandals in the ministry. You know, Brother Stare and everything. We saw all the people that came out there. Some were some came out. Some were kicked out. And uh, I'm not going to go too much into that. But I've seen both. I've seen people come out and almost completely fall away back into a worldly lifestyle. I've seen others trying to hold their ground on what they got and struggling and stumbling and but slipping back and whatever. That would be like backsliding. To me, backsliding in, and apostasy are the same but a different degree. Backsliding is falling but not falling away. Apostasy is more like a very dramatic, treacherous, completely abandoning 
everything you started off as. And there shall come a great, you know, that day shall not come except there come a great falling away. Apostasy. Just abandoning all the pure holy principles you started out with. Just abandoning them. But God is going to make us see our backslidings and God causes us to approach and I'll read the scripture in Jeremiah where he says, your own backslidings shall reprove you. Believe me, I'm not putting forth a finger against you. This is what I'm seeing in myself. You know, I would decry and lament and moan to God of certain situations and people and authorities who have been over me that made me feel like it was was choking out what God was giving me to, to teach and they wouldn't let me teach it. And to a certain extent, that was true. But now, if I get under uh, out from under the authority uh, in, in the influence of the people that I think were choking me out and not letting my calling come forth, that I'm blowing it because I'm letting myself be choked out by the cares of life. So on the one hand, if I'm not being choked out by the influence of uh, people who are over me or influencing me because of their backslidings and apostasies, and yet I'm struggling being choked out anyway. So God must be just shaking his head. Well, that, And so what, what, what am I saying? I'm saying I see myself being choked out in my own perception of how caught up I am in the issues of life. My own perception of it. My own experience of it. That my own uh, reaction to it becoming increasingly vexed and embittered and frustrated and discontent with my lot in life. Lot vexed his righteous soul every day by lingering around in the world. Now, don't get me wrong. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So to a certain extent, I ought to work so that I can eat. <laughs> to a certain extent, I'm fulfilling the will of God. To another extent, if, 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 it, if it completely consumes me, he, said, didn't say, he didn't say, don't be charged with cares of life. Everyone has to be charged or involved or devote themselves to think through and be responsible for your cares of life to a certain degree. You have to be charged with whatever you're supposed to do in this life. Don't be overcharged. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the degree of which, by which it consumes you. So if every day I head out at 8 o'clock and I'm out in the road and working and I don't get back till 10 at night and it goes on like that night after night after night and I just can't seem to pray, can't seem to really seek God the way I want to. I'm kind of consumed in work. That's all I can think about. I'm losing touch with what's happening on the face of the earth. Then I'm not only charged, I'm overcharged. Well, anyway, your own backsliding is going to reprove you. Your own backsliding. We'll read the scripture later. So what does God say to the backsliding? He said, well, I'm married to you. Turn. You know, repent and uh, turn and I will uh, take you one of a city, two of a family. I'll bring you back to Zion and all of that. And we know what Revelation says about the church of, uh, you know, you've left your first love. Right? You left your first love. Mm -hmm. Ephesians? Yeah, Yeah, you're right. The church of Ephesus. These things saith he that hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the golden candlestick. Now, I've heard this preached so many times that about leaving your first love, and I've heard people say it, that it's almost become kind of like a cliche. (laughs) But it's still relevant, right? It's still relevant. It's going to be more so. As we see the day approaching. I know your works, your labor, your patience, how you cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them to be liars. You have borne, you have had patience, and for my name's sake you have labored and hath not fainted. Sounds, sounds like I could almost put myself in that category at times. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee because I was left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent, do the first works, or I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And I often preach from one, a letter to one of the other churches where he says, you know, I know thy works and thy faith and thy patience and thy charity and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first, where he starts the list with works and he ends the, work, ends the list with works and says the last works are to be more than the first. 
And uh, the secret there, if you want to call it the secret or the mystery, is that when you're first saved, you have a, most people have a great zeal for the Lord. And they're, it's like Jeremiah 2, uh, and I'll probably read that too, Jeremiah 2, uh, where it says, uh, I remember you, God says, the love of thine espousals, the, the, the love of your youth. When, when, when you went after me in a wilderness that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of all your increase. In other words, I remember you when we, when we first met, you know, when we were first joined together, when you were first saved. The love of your espousals, you know, your determination to become one with Christ. How zealous you were, how pure your intention and your, your love and your fervent, to, you know, to, to attain purity and do what God wants. And you went after me in the wilderness. And then it all fell away. Well, and that's the way, it's, the way it is. It's almost like we, uh, we start off with our zeal when we're first saved, but it's a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And without knowledge, uh, some, in certain ways, we get tricked, we get deceived, we get beguiled, and we let the guard down, we drop the standard, we backslide, we kind of start to lose what we had, and we lose the zeal, and the, the, the big, long, hot, dry season comes along, and then... But what God is saying is that um, then you go through a bunch of trials of faith and chastisements and scourges and corrections and all these kinds of things. And then when you finally come back and you look back and see how but that love you had that you left and then you now desire to get back to it, he says, go back to your first works. You know, you started off like that, but back then you did it in, in a zeal without knowledge. It was, you went after the Lord in a, in a land not sown. A land not sown. It's like you had a heart. Your heart is the land. But in your early days of Christianity, it wasn't sown with the knowledge of the Word of God. It wasn't sown. It was pure. It was zeal. It was love. It was. It it, it had integrity. It had righteousness of God in it. But it was. It it did not have. It uh, it was a land not sown. It didn't have a full understanding of what the will of the Lord was. So it got kind of applied haphazardly, non, whatever, in a way that, that was not perfect in the flesh. But now, when God is going to bring this flood of affliction and, and it's going to cause us to examine ourselves and be reproved by our own backslidings and return to the Lord with the same fervency and love that we had at the beginning, now we're going to produce works and we're going to have all kinds of knowledge of God. Now, through the experiences that we've been in, God wants those works to be more than the first. Well, anyway, we're talking about going into the ark because of the waters of the flood and how backslidings work, when, how God uses backslidings to accomplish this. All right, now, uh, if you will return, uh, I'm just going to skip some stuff, but we, we have a promise here, if we will return. You know, what did Jeremiah said? Amend your ways and your doings. We've heard people say, including Brother Stare, repentance is a spirit. Well, repentance is fruit. It's doing. It's doing. If repentance is just a spirit, that's one thing. But if you're going to say repentance is a spirit, then repentance is a spirit that produces an action, a deed, a work of amending your ways. Stop doing the evil that you were doing. Now, we're going to hear in Jeremiah about backsliding and how God laments that my fear is not in you. What is the, one of the primary evident tokens that the fear of God is not in a person? Because they will not depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. They won't stop doing their sins. They continue in their sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! Shall we continue in sin for any reason? The Bible tells you to strive towards your sin. It tells you no. It tells you strive against sin. We have not resisted unto blood. Striving against sin. Not just the condition of unbelief sin. Striving against committing the actions and deeds of sin. Because we know that this body is for the Lord to produce a pure, righteous, holy image and testimony to our brethren, to the world. You shall be witnesses unto me. 
First in Jerusalem, first among yourselves, then in Judea to the religious people around you, then to, whatever, then to Samaria, and eventually to the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, our bodies are a living testimony. You are the living epistle. Return ye backsliding children, I will heal, and I will heal your backsliding. Conditional upon repentance. Stop sinning. Oh, that's just your own works if you stop sinning. Oh, really? Not if it comes because of your, your understanding that it is the uh, command of God to repent. All you have to do is acknowledge in the spirit of your mind that this is the truth. And then what do you do? You, you, you take a move away from evil. Evil actions, evil deeds. Return ye backsliding children, I'll heal, heal, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth. Their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us. For we, we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth even unto this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then thou shalt not remove. In other words, thou shalt not remove from your status of acceptance with me. Thou shalt not remove. And thou shalt swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, in righteousness, and the nation shall bless themselves in him, and, and in him shall they glory. Thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, your hardness of heart, your seardness of conscience. Break it up. Break it up. Let the stuff enter in. Acknowledge the truth. Only acknowledge. If God peradventure may grant them repentance according to the acknowledging of the truth. And that's repentance isn't simply the acknowledging of the truth and nothing else. But repentance starts with the acknowledging of the truth. Yeah. It starts with. Right? If we confess our sins, that's it. All you have to do is confess your sins. No. Confession of your sins is not the end of the issue of the righteousness of God. Confession of your sin is not the finish of the race. Confessing your sin is not the end of the race. Confession of your sin is only the acknowledge, it's only the starting blocks. Right? When you run a race, you get in the starting blocks and the gun goes off. And then you start the race. Well, when you confess your sin, that's just the gun going off and you started the race. You better follow through until you got the righteousness of Christ coming forth in your flesh. Or guess what? If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He that is born... And then bring you till, till you're born again in that area of your life. He that is born of God cannot. He that is born of God cannot commit sin. Why? Because the seed, the Word, remains in him until he overcomes. To him that overcometh. Well, are we going to wait till Jesus comes to overcome? No. Our overcoming, the exercise, the pursuit of overcoming is, is right here and right now. Oh, we know uh, Lazarus will rise at the last day when Jesus comes. No. Didn't I not tell you? I am the resurrection. You're going to see resurrection power and glory right here and now. I'm here now. I am the resurrection. Oh, we'll stop sinning and be righteous when Jesus comes. No, you missed it. You missed it. Jesus Christ is right here now. The righteousness from God is to be revealed now and here. Now. Don't put it off there. God is. He is. Now faith is. Righteousness is here. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called you to glory and virtue, which means purity. Now, so repentance starts in your mind. As I said before, you can't change your heart. Your heart's like a slow-moving vehicle. Your heart's going to be changed through an operation of God. But where do you start? Where do I start? I acknowledge the truth. If God may grant them repentance. Peradventure, if God may grant them repentance according to the acknowledging of the truth. King Nebuchadnezzar, his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride. When the plague of leprosy is in your head, when it's in your mind, when you're proud in your mind and your conscience is seared and you won't acknowledge the truth, you will never, never, never find a place of repentance. 
Because when the plague is in your head, he grabs his lip and he says, utterly unclean, utterly unclean. In Leviticus 13, 14, the law of the leper. When the man, his plague is in his head, he is utterly unclean. Utterly. You've got to make room in your mind. It starts there in your mind. If your mind's hardened in pride, you will never repent. You will never do it. Thus saith the Lord to the man of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your hardened ground, your fallow ground, your seared conscience. Acknowledge the truth. Sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. And then the state of backsliding can become consistent and over a long period of time. Jeremiah 8, 5, 6, and 7. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. This is what we're talking about. Uh, when you refuse to return, when you love darkness rather than light, when you find ways to sear the conscience, to strive towards sin, continue in sin, the excess, the superfluity of naughtiness, the excess, the excess. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course, as the horse rusheth to the battle. That's a very determined, spirited, deliberate, I'm rushing towards this. I'm going for it. You know, I'm pursuing, I'm going to pursue this sin. You know, I'm not just going to, oh well, I'll have a beer once in a while. No, no, I'm, I'm going to, every, every, every fridge I'm going to, every, every refrigerator I see, I'm going to open it up and see if there's a potential for me to have a beer. Every one. At every turn, every moment. I'm going to try to drink as much beer as I can, rushing to the battle. You know, this is the uh, issue of, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, this is the accusation that I endured anyway, as, uh, in reference to uh, Brother Stair and his activities, which we've been pleading all along that uh, we're not against grace, we're not against mercy, we're not against the forgiveness of sins. And I drew the line when you talk about the excess, the superfluity of sin, and the excessive, repeated, continual pursuit of a sin in seriousness of conscience. The Bible, and, and so you're striving more towards your sin than you are against it. And that's, that's when you know you're transgressing uh, grace. So, the uh, indictment against us would be, well, no, you, you uh, that uh, a man like that, who's in a complete excess of sin, well, the, the uh, indictment against us was that, was, was based on the story of when they brought the ark and the oxen stumbled. The oxen that carried the ark stumbled. And Uzzah put forth his hand to try to, to, to steady the ark. And, and God killed him right there. Kill them, and it's supposed to be like you know. Don't don't enter your own works to try to straighten out when the oxen are stumbling, and the oxen are supposed to represent the ministers, right? When Paul says, "Don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn," where the corn is the word of God, and the oxen treads out the corn. The preacher is preaching the corn, the word of God. But what I'm saying is, there's, there's a distinction between that and a horse rushing to the battle. So, the degree of sin, the transgression against grace amongst many Christians in our generation at this time is they're not stumbling oxen. They are not stumbling oxen. They have set a determination to sin. And they are going for it. And they are a horse rushing to a battle. They're not a stumbling oxen. It's mischaracterizing the degree and the... Uh, the wickedness of the sin that's being committed in our generation. It may, may look to some people like stumbling oxen, but it's not. It's, it's a horse rushing to the battle. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course, his horse rushed to the battle. Yea, the stork knows their appointed times, the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the, of the Lord. So the word for backsliding and for apost uh, apostatizing is uh, apostasia. When you defect from the truth, when you forsake the right way. 
All right. Now I made a reference to Jeremiah two, and uh, I'm going to read some of it. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness. And the, that represents the world. In a land that was not sown, that means in a heart where no one has really sown the, the knowledge of God in you yet. You're saved, you knew you were a sinner, you repented, you received the Holy Ghost, but you really didn't have the real comprehensive vision of God's eternal purpose. You hadn't been sown a land that was not sown. But what was your spirit towards God? Holiness unto the Lord. The first fruits of all is increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert? pits and through a land of drought and of the shadow of death through a land that no one passed through and where no man dwelt and i brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof but when you entered you defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination well if you want to just look at it first the so-called christianity at large as you see in our generation christianity has has have has the uh who was saying that now Oh, there's a there's a prophet, an Indian prophet, and you know, uh, on YouTube, and he said something noteworthy. He said, in the older days of America, when America had pure form of Christianity, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, for the most part, America became the fountainhead of all Christian outreach into the whole world. The whole world was in darkness, and it's America that went overseas and started all kinds of missionary works and everything else, and brought the gospel out there. Now, America has apostatized. The church has apostatized. We have uh, backslidden and apo slash apostatized to a certain degree. So this Indian prophet was saying in the early days, it was America that went and showed everybody else how to live holy. But now, he has to take those people, send them over to America and tell us how we've uh, apostatized and if you want to think of a person, Dimitri Dudeman had to come all the way over here from Romania yeah. and prophesy to the Americans, this is Sodom, see this Los Angeles, New York, duh, duh, duh. America will burn, this is Sodom, this is Sodom, this is Sodom. <laughs> the church is Sodom, it's the spirit of sodomy. So, um, gone far from me, walked after vanity, become vain, uh, so they made God's land. They defiled God's land, made his heritage an abomination. The people mock and they laugh to scorn the prosperity preachers and the antics of many things that so-called Christianity has become in America. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see and send unto Kedar. Consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Has a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste, and the cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the children of Nathan, to happen these, have broken the crown of thy head. Has thou not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt, to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? And here's the scripture I'm going for. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore, and see that it is an evil thing, and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. How do we know the fear is not in you or me? We won't depart from evil. Um, the transgression. 
the evil deeds and practices, the transgression of the wicked, saith within my heart, he doesn't fear God. He's continuing in it, full steam ahead. And I still remember the brother that asked me, what's the difference between King David's sin with Bathsheba and Hophni and Phinehas who lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle? Because Hophni and Phinehas were destroyed by God. You know, Eli tried to warn his sons, Nay, my sons, this is no good thing that I hear about you. And, but he wouldn't restrain them. And yet, they wouldn't hearken unto Eli because the Lord would slay them. God already decided, these guys are, are wicked, I'm going to slay them. So God didn't give him a place of repentance. David, he got a place of repentance. And what? it's the same act, sleeping with a woman. Well, what's the difference? Well, we said it before. First of all, David, uh, he had an affair with a, another man's wife, and that was the isolated incident. Right? All the other women were the, the women God gave him. And again, I'll say, God let David do all those things because that's the, what people did in those days, and they were in the days of ignorance, and God winked at the ignorance, and he suffered all of that stuff. And as a king, there, there were wives and things that God gave into David's hand for that time. God didn't give him Bathsheba, but that was a singular incident. And God gave him a place of repentance, and he suffered in his household for the rest of his life because of that. How about Hophni and Phinehas? They, wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they weren't granted repentance. Hophni and Phinehas were not an isolated incident. It was a continual Horse rushing to the battle, a predatory, idolatrous, excessive, repeated over and over again, exploiting the motion of a woman coming to the door of the tabernacle to give her praise and worship to God and intercepting that worship and taking the worship unto themselves in the form of a sexual act over and over and over and over and over. Beguiling, beguiling and manipulating repeatedly over and over and over and over again. Cultivating their own sense of idolatry until they could not be redeemed. God. And what does Hophni mean? Both hands full. What does Phinehas mean? The mouth of a serpent. So there's two elements there. The, the mouth of a serpent the manipulation of the word of God deceitfully to cause the women, right, to come to them in an act of idolatry. See, this is whoremonging. That's why whoremonging is in the list of book of revelations. But the fearful and the unbelieving murders. and murderers and... Whore, well, why? Whoremonging is just having sex with another woman, isn't it? Nope. That's not what whoremonging is. Whoremonging is idolatry. Taking the glory from God. It is a ultimate issue of ego and pride and a self-exaltation. That's what it is. See, David didn't have that stuff in his heart. But Hophni and Phinehas did. So it's the combination of the mouth of a serpent, a beguiling of the word of God, and then Hophni, both hands full, like a horse rushing to the battle. Not just one woman who comes to lay, to, comes to the door of the tabernacle, but the next woman, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then they continual have their heart completely set on the exercise with no godly fear because they never repented. That's the difference between King David and Hophni and Phinehas. It's even revealed in the uh, meanings of the names of Hophni and Phinehas. Okay, so where am I? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Yeah. It's an evil thing and better you've forsaken the Lord and my fear is not in thee. See, those guys had no fear of God. Pop nine finished. No fear. A far of old time I broke your yoke, burst your bands, and you said, I will not transgress when upon every high hill under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Okay, see, we all got to repent. I have to repent. I'm in process of repenting. If I solicit prayer, just pray that I can follow through because I've set my determination. Now that's, that's something I do in my mind. Hopefully my heart is strong enough to continue and actually fulfill my sanctification from the world, my being overcharged with work out there in the world to the point where it affects my relationship with God, it affects the ability to perform my calling. 
Well, thank God I can perform my calling to a certain degree, for my sake and yours, I guess, but could it be better? Could it be... Could I be more sanctified? Could I be more skillful in my handling of the Word? Could I be more comprehensive? Could I give uh, more spirits? What, what have you? You see what I'm saying? Because the thing about a gift is the gift works, right? The gift is a gift. The gift works. It's, it's not a measure of my righteousness or my status towards God. Right? I could be a bank robber. I could be a whoremonger. No, I'm not. Okay, at this point, I'm not. But I could be. And I could step into here, address the people of God, and if God sees your hearts are in need, your hearts are open, and you need to hear something, I will get a great anointing and great liberty, and I'll preach the word of God, and I have no status, that's no indication that I have a right standing, standing with God. Because the gift and the calling, it'll work. It's without repentance. It's a gift. Once I get up here and the Spirit starts moving, the Spirit will use whoever's here to provide whoever else is here, and the Spirit will use whatever tools at its disposal. It may not be the perfect tool, or it may be the right tool that's not quite working right, but it's working enough that God can use it, right? <laughs> well, it's like I said, if I, if I don't have a hammer to hammer the nail in, what have I got? Oh, there's a pipe wrench. Well, pipe wrenches put pipes together. Yeah, I like, but I can turn it upside down and hammer and nail in. It's kind of awkward. And it's way heavier than a handle. And I really don't like it, but, but I can do it. I can, I can take the wrong tool. You know what I'm saying? I can take a tool that half works and use it to the best I can anyway. Here I have a saw and I want to cut a piece of wood and the teeth in the saw are dull as anything. It, I don't, is it even going to cut through this wood? Well, I'll take the saw and I'll cut as far as I can and then... The saw just keeps jamming and that's as far as I can take it. Okay, well, I got about halfway through that piece of wood. Let's see if I can snap it over my knee, right? One way or another, I can get that piece of wood cut in half. I would have rather had a saw with sharp teeth in it, but I'll get the job done. And that's the way God is. He wishes things were better. And sometimes, because we're not in the state we should be, it kind of handicaps God a bit. And he has to do a workaround. Has to do it in a, a roundabout way. He's got to use maybe the tool that wasn't perfect or a, a tool that's not necessarily made for that job. Right? I mean, if there's no, if no, there's no teacher around, he can use somebody else who's just well-versed in the Word of God. Maybe a teacher, teacher's gift, maybe he's a little more comprehensive, but God can... Use something else. You know, the gift is the gift. Never, never is the operation of a gift by itself a measure of your right status before God. Because the gift is just going to work. Now I think, and I hope, and I have, uh, generally I have witness and I get visitations from the Holy Ghost enough to know that to a certain degree I'm in my calling and, and to a certain degree I'm in the will of God with this stuff. But, um, hey, can we do better? And I'm not, I'm not saying by your own works. I'm saying, can we give more diligence? Can we seek God more? Can we be more sincere? Can we yearn and long to be more awakened? Can we say, wow, we have to perfect our holiness. We can't let the spirit of the world enter in, you know, through the internet, through the TV, through the radio. We got to, we got to be careful what we expose ourselves to. Yeah, I can work, but I can't spend 10, 12 hours a day, five days a week at hotels to the neglect of my relationship with God. And how do I know that I'm backslidden? My own backslidings are reproving me. How do I know? Because I see the misery, the vexation of my own spirit. I see my discontent. I see my irritability. I see my, my lack of peace. I'm not always lacking peace, but enough to say, hey. So that's what I say. If, if I solicit your prayers, it's that I can follow through on this. Because I've, I've started. I've, there's something different now going on in my mind, in my actions. Something different. What's causing me to do all this? Because of the waters of the flood. I see what's happening in the world. Wow. I just watched a video of uh, a little band-aid with little needles and they put it on your right hand. And uh, the little needles put little quantum dots on there to mark you. And they read it with an infrared laser scanner. It's an invisible mark. And they're already saying, well, how will we know that you've been vaccinated? Well, we'll give you a vaccine and then we'll put this mark on you. 
And they're going to put it on your hand. And then someone said, well, what if you're a, a worker and you wear gloves and then your skin gets uh, chafed and everything else and it, it hinders the ability to read that mark because it's on your hand and you use your hand for this and doctors will wear gloves on their hand and workers wear... Oh, well, we can put it in your forehead. <laughs> Does that not sound like Revelation 13 to you? Yeah. So what's got me alarmed? What's got me... Uh, and I'm not, like I said last week, I'm not pushing a fear-mongering. I'm not trying to make anybody go into some panic. You just, we got to arm ourselves with the right mindset and renew it and keep thinking about it and keep watching and keep finding out what the will of God is to be ready for this. We have to be ready. Remember what I said? The preparation for the Great Tribulation is more important than the Great Tribulation itself. Because you can get to the Great Tribulation, but if you're not prepared, well... You know, I can put myself here every Sunday at 5 o'clock, but if I don't prepare, I'm going to flub and fumble, fumble and what have you. So I do. I set Sundays aside so that I can prepare. I meditate, I study, I pray, I read, think about things. Anyway, Jeremiah, back to Jeremiah 2. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked. And I'm going to say this again because it's... Uh, um, you know how uh, Psalm 32 says, uh, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. I've referred to lots of people, including Brother Stair himself. Quote the scripture and stop right there. Truncate, like shorten the scripture. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And I always point out, wait, 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 there's a qualifier. Who is the man that the Lord does not impute iniquity to? And who, whose spirit is no guile? So if you're in iniquity, but your spirit is in, not in guile, you're not trying to deliberately pursue sin. You're not trying to deliberately coerce other people with deceit into fueling your and feeding your pleasure. That is deceit. That is guile. That is craftiness. That is deliberation. That is provisional. That iniquity is not not imputed. That kind of iniquity is imputed. You've got to look at the two categories of iniquity. Some iniquity is not imputed. Why? Because you're doing your best. You're walking according to the light that you have attained so far. You are striving against sin, but some iniquity manifests. You commit some sin that you try not to, but you slipped and you fell. So God will not impute you with that iniquity. Because there was no guile. You weren't deceitful. You weren't handling the word of God deceitful. You weren't being crafty. You weren't being deliberate. And whose spirit is no guile. But what if you commit iniquity and you're full of guile, full of deceit? You're marked. You're marked. And as I said before, you're going to be marked one way or another. If God starts marking your iniquity, then you can be sure that when you get to the mark of the beast, you'll get that one too. Because that is the mark that identifies you with Satan. And if you're already identifying with Satan in your ungodly, lustful, passionate lives, then what's going to happen? Well, I'm just saying, the potential is there. Though thou wash thee with nitre and take much soap. See, repentance is not just a uh, rhetorical thing. I confess my sin. Oh, I just acknowledge the truth. Yeah, it starts with that, but it follows through. It's like holiness. Holiness is not the rhetoric of God. You're not holy just because God said you're holy. If God said you're holy, He said you're holy because He sees you're going to follow through and live the holy, pure life. And God won't say it unless He sees you're going to do that. Right? You're not just holy because God said, without seeing the results follow through in your lifestyle. It's more than just believing. More than just believing. The devil believes. The, you know the devil believes that Jesus came and shed his blood for the sin of mankind? Do you know the devil believes that? He does. He believes it. What good does it do him? Why? Because he can't repent. Jeremiah, continuing in Jeremiah 2, you know, I planted thee a noble vine, a right seed. How art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine? Though thou wash with nitre and take soap, your iniquity is marked. How can you say I am not polluted? I 
I do not live by lust, right? You see, you see men say that. Now, I am not controlled by lust. How can you say that? How can you say I'm not polluted when you continually go on like that? How can you say that? This is an indictment against the church. How can we say we're not polluted when, we can, when we're still going after the world, still being assuaged and entertained and, uh, you, you know, um, whatever. Our consciences are being kind of uh, put to sleep by worldly influences and everything. Well, um, how can you say I'm not polluted? I've not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways, a wild ass in the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. Wherever the wind blows you towards another beer, another sin, another transgression, just, just let yourself be carried off into another one. Snuff up the wind whenever you want, whenever it pleasures you. See, as a jewel of gold in the snout of a pig, so is a fair woman without discretion. The jewel of gold is like the gift of God. You can have the gift of God, but if you're living like a pig, right? Yeah. Well, you can put the, the greatest gift on a man, and if he's living like a pig, like a, a lust, whatever, you, you can put a fair, fair, the, 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 the most beautiful jewel on a pig, it's still a pig. That's what I'm saying. In her occasion, who can turn her away? Who's going to stop the wild ass? She's determined to do this. All that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. Withhold thy foot from being unshod. Like, just don't go fly off and do things unshod, unprepared, without deliberately thinking about the consequence of your actions. Your foot is unshod. That's called being cavalier, loose caboose. Withhold your foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou said, Nope, there is no hope, for I have loved my strangers, and after them I will go. Such is the way of the adulterous woman. She eats, and she wipes her mouth and goes, Ah, I have done no evil. I am not motivated by lust. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Guess what? Your inequity is marked. You're in for a surprise, right? We heard, uh, Oh, you don't believe God has accepted my repentance. And we see a man... You know, Brother Stair, and did we see that uh, he was supposed to get a pardon from his charges in 2002, and it went to a governmental agency, a pardon board, and that pardon board is made up of religious members, Baptist preachers, and everything else, and they are a governmental body, they are a power in government, and the powers that be are ordained by? God. Okay, so they're the ministers of? God. Okay, so you fear that power. You fear that. And so they become an, they become, uh, an expression of God to us. They're an expression of God to us. God wants to say something to us. He can express it to us through the governmental power if He wants. So they're supposed to expunge Brother Stair's record like he never committed any sin. And they said, oh, we, we, this is just a formality. We'll get you pardoned. So they applied for the pardon. And what did the governmental body do say? They said, no, we're not pardoning this. We're not pardoning this. So they went back the next year. Every, every, every year they can appeal the ruling. Every year they appeal the ruling. They go back to the pardon board. The next year, what did they say? No, we're not pardoning him. And they went back the next year. No, we're not pardoning him. And they went down the, at least 14 years they went. 14 times at least in a row they said, No pardon, no pardon, no pardon, no pardon. That's a voice of a government power. Coming down from God. No pardon. No pardon. I'm not accepting your repentance. You haven't repented. That's what God's saying when that happens to you. Yeah. He will not pardon your transgressions. Now, I've said all along, this is not about adultery or anything else. It's a, it's a transgression against grace. It's a breach of charity. This, is what, this has gone into the spiritual realm. It's gone into the spiritual realm. Behold, I send an angel, the Holy Ghost. You won't obey the Holy Ghost. You won't let the Holy Ghost bring you to the acknowledging the truth and turning from your evil ways. And you continue in all of that. He will not pardon your transgressions. And then God gave the witness for 14 years in a row. No pardon, no pardon, no pardon, no pardon, no pardon. Oh, you, got, you people don't think God has accepted my repentance. Well, I know God has not accepted your repentance. Now, I can't speak for the last two or three years because I've been out of there. It doesn't appear that he has. We don't know. I don't know for sure what goes on, but at least in that time frame, it was very clear. All right. 
But God is going to bring the whole world to testify against us in our backslidings. In one way, shape, or form. James talks about looking into the perfect law of liberty. When you look into the perfect law of liberty, you get a reflection back and you get to see yourself. Well, part of that is reading the Word of God or being exposed to the Word of God and letting the Holy Ghost convict you and show you what you're doing. But there's an essence to this, the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? Well, I'm not under the law. I'm at liberty. I'm in the law of liberty. I'm in the law of Christ. I feel after God. And I walk and I try to do what I believe and I judge as what I think God would want me to do. I think God wants me to do this. You know, you make an honest evaluation and try to think, well, I think maybe God wants me to do this. And you may not be sure, but you rise up and you walk. You're at liberty. Go ahead. Try it. See if God wants you to do that. Go ahead. See if He wants you to go into that smoke full bar so you can witness and save people in the bar. Or, or you know, that, which would be a fairly obvious thing that really Christians shouldn't do, generally. Or maybe God does want me to, uh, whatever, uh, Stop going to the strip clubs. and the, Well, that would be something God does want you to do. Whatever. So you rise up and you walk. You start making moves. And the consequence of your moves are going to show you what kind of man you are. Now, I don't think God minds if I works at the, work at the hotels. I mean, my man doesn't work, neither should he eat, right? So I'm going to go work at the hotels. So it's, to me, it seems like something that's legitimate that God could accept. So I go out and work at the hotels. But what if I get choked out, swallowed up, overconsumed? And it begins to affect me. And then uh, I backslide by not tempering the amount of time I work out there. I let it consume me. I say yes to everybody. I somehow get deceived into thinking I'm obligated to do what everybody asks me to at all times, whether they're the church or whether they're the heathen, and, the, and it carries me into a... A backsliding. I lose ground. I lose ground of the spirituality with the status and the communion I used to have with God. I'm looking at... I, I'm at liberty. I can work at hotels. I'm at liberty. I can go work at hotels. But the consequence of how I perform that is going to come back and show me what manner of man I am. Now I'm seeing what manner of man I am. Well, I, I don't want to forget what manner of man I am. I want to repent. I want to follow that path back, back to the first love, back to the... Uh, diligence towards God and everything else. And that's where I'm at and that's what I'm trying to do. And I've been encouraged the last few weeks because I'm, I'm getting real, real close to closing out some things. I hope it's not too late. Right? We don't want it to be too late. Remember the virgins? They knew what to do. The foolish virgins, well, we'll go out and get our oil. We know what to do. And then they came back. After they did everything they needed to do, they came back. But hey, it's too late. The door is shut. Well, this is the kind of the like I say, I'm not trying to make every, anybody go into a panic or to a fear. I'm just trying to bring an awareness so that we give diligence. So another thing that uh, you have to remember and that came to my mind was uh, in reference just to, to myself and what I'm going through is that, yeah, I'm looking at all this stuff going on at, uh, in politics and the uh, New World Order and the, the spirit of Antichrist coming in and all this darkness and prevailing and what looks like, you know, if they're going to stamp out Donald Trump, how much more the Christians and that sort of thing. Well, but just remember in the midst of that boat, in the midst of that boat, when the winds and the waves begin to rise up and become boisterous, where is Jesus? He was asleep. He was asleep in the bottom of the boat. In the bottom of your soul, where Christ dwells, there will be a peace of God that passes all understanding. There remains a rest to the people of God. So I'm not trying to promote a panic or a fear. And yet there is a fear of God. As we said before, fear of God is what? It's clean. What does the fear of God does? It moves. Noah moved with fear. What brought down the fear? Oh, the waters are falling. You know, God is going to drown out the world. That made him fear. Oh, we got to get into the ark. God knows how to make external circumstances rise up to the point where it will cause you to enter in. And that's where we're at, God is going to deal with backslidings. But with all this issue of backsliding, how it, uh, it, it's the indictment against us, our own backslidings and wickedness reproves us. Yet for all that, there is still a promise. If you will follow this back to your relationship to Jesus Christ, back to your first love, then I will heal your 
backslidings. I will heal them. So you see, it's incentive to repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. repent. Uh, let not that which is lame be taken out of the way. But I'm, I'm not trying to scare you to the point where your, your knees knock and you become lame and you don't know what to do and you can't rise up and walk because you're so much in a panic. You know, don't you know, let it be healed. Let it inspire in the hope of God and the hope of restoration a move back to God. And it involves this backsliding. How does God cause it? He causes it with the flood, with the affliction. How can you say I'm not polluted, I'm not going off their bail and so on? Yeah. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? What have I been doing wasting all my time in these hotels? Lord, what is happening? Okay, I'm not trying to... No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. As the thief is ashamed when he's found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. Their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of the trouble they will say, Arise and save us. But where are thy gods which thou hast made? Let them arise, that they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods. So if I just let myself be consumed in hotel work and I get in all kinds of trouble, am I going to have to have God say to me, Well, let your hotel guys bail you out. They're your gods. You know, anything you put more forth more than God is your God. Right? Your idol. Right? Oh, God, restore my marriage. Oh, well, go to your porn sites and go to your people that give you sex stimulants and the people that sell you that stuff. Ask them to foot the bill for your marriage counseling. Let them save your marriage. You look to them for the last umpteen years. Let them save you. Don't cry out to me about that. Is that what we're going to have God say to us? This, this is the patterns, right? These are the patterns. We're trying to hold these things in our conscience until... They, they change our doings. And I'm not saying to, in a, self, in, in, a, in a work of self-righteousness, they change our doings in approaching unto God in all seriousness, in all sincerity, in all godly fear. Wherefore will you plead with me? You've all transgressed against me, saith the Lord. And what have we been emphasizing the last few weeks? Isaiah chapter 1, the whole body is sick from the head to the sole of the feet. The whole thing's out of order. Everything's out of order. Now, where did it start? It started at the top. The princes, the priests, the prophets, they apostatized. They went after lust. They're the ones who sold up. Our first fathers have transgressed against us, the Bible says. And then from the prophets, profaneness went forth into all the land. So if it's all going to be restored, where's it going to start? At the top. It's going to start at the top. The rulers have to repent. I have to repent. Right? If, if I don't sanctify my calling, this is the way i got to see it. I'm not trying to be iniquitous and say I'm so important, more important than anybody else, but you have to realize that there is an importance. And what motivates me, but what did Jesus say? Uh, for their sakes, I sanctify myself. What if Jesus didn't set himself apart to take the cross, set himself apart to preach the eternal purpose of God? Then nobody would hear it. Who would be saved? What's going to happen if I don't sanctify myself unto this calling? Who's going to suffer? The people that God brings. They're going to suffer if I can't do this in its fullness. To what degree I'm not sanctified? And what sanctifies the gift? Does God sanctify the gift? No. The altar. The altar sanctifies the gift. The altar. The altar is the flesh body. I'm the altar. I'm the one who sanctifies the gift. I'm the one responsible for applying myself to get separated so that the gift can work and be demonstrated and seen by the church for the perfecting of the saints. And, you know, we all depend on each other to a certain extent like that, right? Because the manifestation of the Spirit's given to every man. Yeah, you need to sanctify what God's doing in you because I need something from that too. I need something from you and you need something from me. The body has to edify itself together together. 
in love. We need that operating, it's a whole like a big, big organism. A, a single body with many members. All right, so you've all transgressed against me. The whole body's sick. The whole heart's faint. From the top of the head to the sole of the feet. Bruises, wounds, putrefying sores. Neither have you been mollified with ointment. That's our state. Okay, this is what God is going to bring a restoration out of all this. How? With affliction. With a new world order. Because of the waters of the flood, we will, we will change. We will seek God. Oh, generation. Oh, and... Wherefore you will plead with me, you've all transgressed. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel? Have I been a land of darkness? Wherefore, say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. You know what that word lords means? We are the governors of our own life. We are independents. We will come no more unto thee. We, won't, we don't have to gather together with the saints. We don't have to come unto God. I mean, there's, there can be more to it, but part of we will not come to God is we will not come to the light. We will not come to the body of Christ. We will not assemble ourselves together. And look, I'm very sympathetic. A lot of the reason some people won't do it is because they're wounded. They've been disenchanted with the scandal and authorities and all that stuff. That's what I said before. And then shall many be offended. Many shall be offended. Scandalizo is the Greek word. Scandal. Why are they offended? Scandal and authority. So you have people who are motivated to rebel against holiness and purity and the, the uh, authority isn't helping a whole lot because there is, we're losing the purity and the integrity and authority and the, the Satan is working diligently double time over time to undermine everybody's confidence in authority. But somewhere you got to get confidence in, in that there is an authority and that there is you know, a structure, a hierarchy that is legitimate, that does have integrity, or that God will instore, restore that integrity. Because what you're, you're saved by submission. Submission to what? Submission to authority. So you can't just throw out the idea that, oh no, I'm, I'll never trust a man of God again. No, somewhere you've got to learn how to trust a man of God, trust a preacher, trust a brother, or trust what God's doing. And see... And have confidence and have a witness that there is at least a degree of integrity in there that will eventually go on to perfection. But right now, the confidence in, of, uh, in authority and many people has been so overthrown, they are offended. Yeah. yeah. So, what do they do? They, they withdraw onto themselves and they become independent. What's the motivation? Well, they're afraid, they have no confidence in authority and they think it's a safety in that, a protection We'll stay alone and we'll stay protected from all of that stuff. But somewhere, God's going to have to knock you out of the complacency and get you coming together. Valley of dry bones, right? The bones are all separated from their parts. And then what happened? Prophesying, preaching, prophesying, prophesying. Then after the prophesying, what happened? A great shaking. The new world order is coming. Then what happened? Then all the, boom, all the bones said, hey, we can't be independent. We can't stay here in our own little pseudo quasi spiritual world we need the body of Christ we got to find us a man of God we got to find out where the word of God's being preached we got to come together we got to get strength well it'll it'll not it, the bones will come together it'll happen can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire yet my people have forgotten me days without number not that I totally forget God but just my forefront conscious mind is too occupied in other things for it to have a real good effect. That's what choking out's all about. Why trimmest thou way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy way. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Well, King Manasseh, what did King Manasseh do? He went from one end of Jerusalem to another, shedding innocent blood. King Manasseh. And the Lord spoke to King Manasseh. Manasseh would not hearken. How, how did God speak to King Manasseh? Well, he sent him wise men and scribes. And, that's what Jesus said. Behold, I send unto you prophets, scribes, wise men. Right? God can send people to warn other men of God of authority. Just make sure it's God that's sending you to do it. A lot of people try to do that on their own will. 
without being authorized or without an unction from the Holy Ghost. But when God wants to deal with something, He can very much take uh, men of any rank and send warning to men of higher rank. They did it in King Manasseh's day. God sent men to King Manasseh to warn him. He went from one end of Jerusalem to the other, shedding innocent blood. And what was the other part about that story that I always used to like to point out? Anyway, um, well, whatever. It's not when that. Yes, that's it. And when Manasseh was greatly afflicted, he humbled himself and besought the Lord God of his fathers. And God entreated him. And then he was buried with his fathers. He died in peace. Well, so that's, that's the thing. Are we a King Manasseh? Or, you know, we, if we haven't repented, are we a King Manasseh? Or are we, are we like the, uh, the angels which kept not their first estate? So God is just reserving them in chains of darkness and they'll never see and they'll never repent. This is the scary thing. Where are we? We're right on the precarious edge of, of uh, salvation and damnation. And then we were talking last week, I think in the week before or, or the week before, if the righteous scarcely be saved. Okay, yet thou sayest, oh, I am innocent. I am not driven by lust. I am innocent. Right? That kind of thing. I am innocent. Surely his anger will turn from me. Behold, God says, I'll plead with you because you say you haven't sinned. Why gottest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou shalt also be ashamed of Egypt as I was ashamed of Assyria. Yea, thou, thou shalt go forth from him and thine hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences and thou shalt not prosper in them. Now in the fear of the Lord is a strong... But you see, for every true, holy, righteous attribute or principle, there is a counterfeit of the devil. We said it before. Oh, the righteous are as bold as a lion. They stand forth and they... Preaching all authority and they're as bold as a lion, right? Full of confidence. Yeah, well, a fool rages and is confident. So don't be hoodwinked just because someone shows a great show of confidence. Well, they're, they're, if they're righteous, they're bold as a lion. If they're not righteous, they're just in a rage. Judging yourself. If a man is in rage, would he not beat his brother maybe 50, 100 times a day? Do you think that's boldness or is that rage? You know, when the Bible says, don't beat your brother more than 30, what, 39 stripes, lest your brother seem vile unto thee, and that's all you can do is, is, do, is put the beat on them. See, again, there's nothing wrong with putting a stripe on your brother if, if you have a calling to do that. What's the issue? It's the excess. It's the excess. And the excess will tell on you. The excess will tell on me. When it becomes excessive, it's out of degree. It's wrong. It's not the Spirit of Christ. Because Christ abides by those spiritual principles. The Spirit of Christ. The operation of His Spirit in a saint. In a brother. In a man of God. In a prophet. In a prophetess. It's going to abide by those criteria of judgment that you see laid out. The principles of the Old Testament and the New. Okay. The Lord hath rejected thy confidences and thou shalt not prosper in them. See, people trying to assert a great confidence in God as though they're, they're, they're uh, representing that confidence as though it's faith in God. But if you're transgressing grace and you're doing all this stuff that we're talking about, then God's going to reject your confidences and you're not going to prosper. All right, and this is something Christopher and I talked about earlier uh, this week to, in the day, day or two. I think today and yesterday. Well, Isaiah 30, starting at verse 15. And guess what? This is where I'll end. Okay, so. Thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And you would not. But you said, no, we will flee upon horses. <laughs> gallop, gallop towards my will, my sin, my pleasure. I'll... Flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee. And we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and an ensign upon a hill. And now a good word to end off. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait.
for him. So who's God going to have mercy on? And you know, Who's God waiting for? The people that will repent and do what we've been talking about all night. That will acknowledge these things. And that will make deliberate turns and moves to ensure their status, their relationship. Well, not just with God, not just with the Father. Who's our fellowship with? Oh, God alone? Who's, who's your fellowship with? Your little enclave of brothers over here or your little enclave of sisters over here and you never meet with anybody else? Is that who your fellowship is with? No. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, who in heaven is the Son? Jesus, the High Priest, the Son of God, right? Exalted, seated, seated at the right hand. Who on earth is the Son? Here we are. We are the Son. We are the Son right here. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. We're preaching last week on Isaiah 58. This is the fast I chose. Loose the bands of wickedness. Let the oppressed go free. To deal your bread to the hungry. To draw them that are cast out to your house. Right? And, and it talks about that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. Oh, Jesus said that man would you know, leave his father and mother, join to his wife. And Adam says, oh, bone of my bone. And Flesh of my flesh. The two shall become one. So, Jesus Christ is the head of the body. He's actually, he actually has an actual body. A glorified spiritual body in heaven. And we are the body of Christ on earth. We're bone of His bone. We're flesh of His flesh. We are all, we are many members, but we are all one. Brother Stair used to say, how can the Baptist church on this corner and then the other Pentecostal church two blocks down the road and nobody ever meets together? Nobody ever meets together. How can you say then that denominationalism is the will of God when it just keeps them separated, when they're only a couple hundred feet apart? What, what keeps them apart? Now, I'm not trying to be hard on anybody. I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? So how can some group of Christians isolate themselves over here in a block down the road? There's another group of Christians that gather uh, every, all the time, but they, they, never, they never have fellowship. How is that Christianity? How is that the will of God? There's something wrong. Like I said, maybe it's something to have compassion on. Maybe it's, you know, fears and wounds in the hearts. It could be a lot of things. But I'm just saying, it, what, are we, what are we saying of repentance is? Just, to, just acknowledge the truth. This is the truth of the Scripture. And if you have trouble with the will of God, like I do, come on. People have trouble gathering. I understand that people always have trouble uh, with issues of their heart trying to fulfill the will of God. I'm not unsympathetic to that. I've known for a long time it's the will of God not to be entangled with the hotels to the extent I'm entangled. I've been trying for the last three years to get untangled to the point where I feel clear that I'm untangled. And I know I'm supposed to, and I struggle with it. Day by day I get trapped. Oh, okay, well... Oh, while you're here, Jonathan, I know you're here to do the toilets, but uh, can you check the AC here? Can you fix the ice machine? Can you do this? Can you do that? While you're here, you know. Well, what happens? Well, I get a little more tangled up. And my next jobs get pushed down the line a little bit. And then I get backlogged. And then I try to work more. And then without realizing it, little by little, uh, it's it's swallowing me up. It's consuming me. So I know what all I know all about knowing what the will of God is, acknowledging what the will of God is, and fighting and struggling to fulfill it. But where do you start? Acknowledge the truth. Acknowledge, only acknowledge, and seek God, and He will eventually give you strength, and He'll work with you. He'll work with circumstances. Like like I say, if I if I can't do this, what's God going to do? He's going to bring the affliction on the face of the earth. I'm going to have to flee from those hotels. You know. Right? Lot lingered in Sodom. He lingered, had to drag him by the hand and drag him out. <laughs> the Lord being merciful unto him. Well, this was God saying, I'm going to be merciful. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and the Lord will he be exalted that he may have mercy on you, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted. For the Lord God is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait on him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And I think Christopher was talking about uh, neither shall thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thou shalt hear, thou shalt see thy teachers and you'll hear a voice 
This is the way of the Lord. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand or to the left. In other words, God promises that if you will turn to Him, He will cause you to hear what it is you're supposed to do. And if you go left or right when you're supposed to go straight, you begin to turn a little bit to the left, you'll hear a voice saying, no, this is the way, walk ye in it. Isn't that what we're after? Clearness? Like I've said to people many times, I, I, you know, my status is I'm single, I'm not married or anything else, I don't have dependents. If, if I go here or go there or move here or move there or drive a thousand miles or two thousand miles that way, uh, it's easy for me to do because I don't have to drag a wife and a family and it's, it's not a big burden, right? I'm at liberty because I'm single. And I really don't have a will of where I want to be. I don't really care if it's here or, or Canada or Timbuktu. I just want to know what is the will of the Lord. And that's my struggle. What, where is the clearness? How do I know? Okay, and if I can't get clearness in my mind as a deliberate thought of the conscience, like some voice breaks through the clouds and says, Jonathan, thou shalt go to Canada at February the 2nd, 9.20 p.m., Okay, if I don't get those explicit instructions from the voice of God, then I am subject to try to study the unfolding. What's in, unfolding around me in the circumstances that might be you know, moving me this way or moving me that, that way? But I do have a fear. I don't want to miss the will of God. I don't want to miss it. But there's a regret in all of that. So maybe we'd be inspired and motivated and challenged by the Word of God to, to get to the will of God. We definitely need each other. You know, have fervent charity among yourselves. It's the only way, only way it's going to happen. Fervent charity amongst ourselves. Praise the Lord. I'm done.